Okay. Okay. This is David Zeeler, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It's Friday, July 22nd, 2022. I am delighted to be here with Professor Kuo Feng Ma. Kuo Feng, it's so nice to be with you. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's my honor to be interviewed. That's so <laughs> nice, Kuo Feng. If you could yeah. tell me, what is your title and institutional affiliation? Well, actually, I was a professor uh, in National Central University for the Department of Geophysics. But uh, just about three years ago, I uh, transferred to another institute called Institute of Earth Sciences, Academia Sinica, but as their agent in NCU. So, so far for my career, I spend most of, most of my time in National Central University as a professor. And now I've become titled researcher in a way. Kuo Feng, do you still maintain the kinds of professorial duties such as supervising graduate students and teaching? Yes, I still do that. And I still actually has a position in NCU as a director uh, for Earthquake Disaster Prevention Center. So and that's why I somehow um, age on in between, but 50-50 almost. Kuo Feng, tell me just as a snapshot in time, what are you currently working on and what's more interesting to you broadly in the field? Okay, uh, I'm currently working on very exciting projects, actually. Uh, I don't know whether you know that about four years ago, we have a large earthquake in eastern western Taiwan, and that's called the Hualien earthquake. Uh, I should say back to 20 years ago, we have another one, 1999, and we have a very important drilling project. So the, currently, I actually carry on another drilling project in Hualien, as what I'm saying now. Uh, we would like to have our observatory go through the fault zone. In the same time, it's so close to the subduction zone, which has the potential to have a mega thrust earthquake, like a magnitude 8 kind of scale of a magnitude. Uh, so we have this observatory, hope to be able to capture more uh, exciting, I shouldn't say exciting in a way, actually, uh, but important signals related to our future earthquake and also to understand earthquake dynamics. And one more thing to add is for this drilling project, we would like to put into this uh, optical fiber observation, which is very uh, uh, somehow our aging observation using optical fiber to detect the ground motion. And we are installing this to the downhole and also to the surface coast of all, and then another downhole. So that would be a very unique setting in the world uh, for the 3D optical fiber observation uh, at site. Kuo Feng, I've come to appreciate there are so many sub-disciplines and specialties in geophysics and seismology. What are the main areas of research that you've undertaken in your career? Okay, uh, I mainly name myself seismologist. So I study seismic waveforms. That's the main field I'm working on. I, I actually uh, try to understand how the earthquake was ruptured through the waveform. And then from the waveform, I also would like to know how this ground motion uh, was moved and how this might impact to the damage, I mean, the, to the buildings, to the people. So I study basically from earthquake physics to earthquake science to earthquake engineering. So at this moment, in addition to this uh, project, I was saying for this 3D optical fiber installation, we call it MIDAS project. Uh, we, I also have another project is try to put the sensors to the buildings. So I would like to study the, how the ground was shaked, but in the same time, I want to know how this shaking really impact to the buildings, partially work together with us for engineering. Kuofeng, many questions about seismology in Taiwan. First of all, tell me about the, the faults in Taiwan, the areas of concern, both historically and currently. Okay, well, basically, Taiwan is a small island, but we have active for almost every 10 kilometers. So you, so you understand that, actually, for some distance, you will notice our topography. You might see this ground deformation that's associated with the fault either on surface or underground. 
So for every, I mean, for the number of earthquakes that every month, maybe we might have a chance to have a magnitude six. Uh, or you feel the ground shaking almost once a couple of weeks, I have to say, especially in Eastern Taiwan. Uh, so the earthquake behavior or seismicity is very high in Taiwan and, and it's very dense. So historically, I have to say that uh, because of that, so uh, they have a large earthquake. Like, I think maybe like every 100 years we have uh, two or three damaged earthquakes. What I mean by damage is to the magnitude like seven. Um, that usually cause very large casualty. Maybe we, we call it like number uh, beyond 100 deaths, we call it damaging earthquake. Um, and of course now I would like to uh, bring the science into this practical exercise, even for the government uh, policy to reduce the impact. So as I mentioned, I, I do the ground motion into the buildings and I, I want to uh, inform our people in Taiwan saying the earthquake is something we cannot avoid, but in the same time we can do better is to reduce the impact. Uh, that can be done in terms of policy and also self-awareness. So, uh, so maybe like 10 years ago, I published Taiwan earthquake model for the earthquake hazard map, which is actually popular in California. You see this California hazard map uh, from time to time. But in Taiwan at that time, we didn't really have this open access to really understand what kind of level of hazard you have in, in your location, because that's a lot of impact for that, you know, the, the, the housing prices, the uh, a lot of business behind that. Uh, however, it's good now uh, because this open data policy and also this social media and all this kind of communication, people actually feel like they have the right to know what kind of risk they are, you know, they are on or they are in. And then uh, how can we do better to let them know in the same time to give them the solution. You know, it, they don't just want to know. They also, also want to know, then what can I do? Uh, and then government actually become nervous because if they have no solution, they don't want to open this message to people, right? Uh, so somehow it's somehow an internal uh, process, but, but I think it's going to the right direction. Um, well, not to mention one more thing is because it's now very hot topic about this semiconductor business, right? Taiwan is one of the most important country to export, import. US now is talking about all these chips and so on. And then we are dense, the high tech um, company in Taiwan, but we have also this impact from the ground shaking. So what I tell them is I try to bring this knowledge to let them know, or you know, they, either they have issues or they come a better preparation about what might happen in 20 years, 30 years, 50 years. So that's how I, I try to, to provide this knowledge, not, to, not just to the government, to people, but also to those uh, important industry partners. They know what kind of risk they are facing Kofang, as you alluded to, understanding and preparing for earthquakes is clearly a national priority for Taiwan. What are the ways that government and industry and academia work together? And how do you specifically slot into those partnerships for Taiwan? Right. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad it's not actually we do have the government, social science, and also the industry partner coming to this together. Um, well, I have to say is in the beginning, of course, it's academic studies. When the earthquake comes, we, we, we calculate all these focal mechanisms that make it to. It's the impact like four or five years ago, uh, we have another large earthquake, uh, 2016 minor earthquake, and this big impact to Thailand. So, the, but actually the industrial partner come to visit me in office in NCU. Uh, the point he was referring is, we have everything prepared following the guidance from the government, but how come the impacts there 
so big than what we expected. So what's wrong? Uh, then I began to deliver my knowledge to them. But then in the same time, I realized what the industry partner need. They, of course, might not need to know what kind of focal mechanism of this earthquake. What they want to know is, so what, what's the level of our risk? Why is it something we don't know? Because usually science, academic, might have more knowledge than the policy uh, government MAC, right? So, so usually science is going beyond the policy. Uh, but important thing is those industry partner they really want to know something beyond the policy because their capital or their value of the company is so big. They cannot, they cannot just, they, they, they have to understand the risk. And that's actually uh, the entry point, an important point to really bringing our knowledge to industry partner. And then because of that, then the government also aware that their policy is behind because you know to change any government policy or regulation take a long time and because of that they are also aware that it's necessary to update this uh, policy or bring in a new uh, regulation in time and that's how we become put in together and that's something like this 10 years maybe Kuo Feng, I wonder if you have a sense of the history of geophysics and seismology in Taiwan, how far back it goes? Yes, uh, well, I didn't mention that, but uh, for historic earthquakes, we do, as I mentioned, uh, we have a good record for 400 years. Uh, when I was a student in NCU, I was undergraduate in um, Department of Earth Sciences, NCU. At that time, it was called Department of Geophysics. Uh, then I just learned, actually, uh, Geophysics is very new to Taiwan, basically. Uh, only, let me see how many years, maybe less than 40 years, 50 years. So when I was, stu when I was a student, our professors have something about seismology, but they are not trained as a seismology. They are usually physicists, but of course physicists are very important to this field as well. So the basic of physics is our mathematics and uh, however, they bring in the knowledge of geophysics. And then uh, we have a very, uh, I forgot how to name this in English, but somehow uh, uh, another generation, somehow one couple generation older, he is the one actually bringing to the government say, hey, we have the earthquake once every 30 or 40 years. We have to build on the seismic network. That was 1976 or something. You know, I was not aware of those at all. But I just, when I get my degree in Caltech, after Caltech, I become to know what's going on for all this history. So I have to say we are lucky to have this uh, very wise scientist. He proposed to our government to have this network. At that time, Taiwan economy was booming. And then, and then during that time, he said, that's something we have to pay attention. And also because of history of Taiwan in history, uh, you know, in 1930 to I think 1950s, we are colonies by J Japan. And then, and then uh, Kuomintang coming to Taiwan after 1949. So when I, when I learned why earthquake hazard or the impact from earthquake was ignored for so long, is because the change of the government every 30 years at that time. And, and also large earthquake comes almost once every 30 years. So in 1980s, the government was here maybe from 1950s. So they, of course, also at the time, they, they don't have enough energy or, or financially to do basic science maybe, but somehow uh, earthquake impact was not so, uh, get a lot of attention like Japan. And so that's, that's something related to the history of Taiwan itself. And then, and then in the same time is for the earthquake once every 30 years, it's also so easy to get to forget. Because now when I educate the undergraduate students, they had no idea about 1999 GC earthquake. 
which for me was such an important impact event in my life. And I'm senior, but I'm not really that old yet. <laughs> but I'm surprised for the senior 22, they have no idea about this earthquake. So for them, when we mention to them why you have to get prepared, they feel like, why so? Because 30 years is actually very critical. So that's why I often to say, 30 years is about the time you really get matured. Either you are so young, so you don't remember anything, or you become old, <laughs> then you forget, forget something. Uh, anyhow, so that, that's how sometimes I, I always try to uh, tell people that earthquake hazard or the impact we have to get prepared. And you will meet that once in a lifetime. And if I go to a public uh, lecture, I will tell them, you will, no matter what, you will meet once in your lifetime. And if you are lucky enough, you might have two, <laughs> two times in your lifetime. Uh, so get prepared. Well, Fung, maybe as a way to, to let you answer some questions about the culture of seismology in Taiwan, we can start with the issue of earthquake prediction. What has been the history of earthquake prediction and the confidence maybe in the 1970s when people were talking about this in Japan and the United States, that this would be a, a, a possibility, a scientific reality at some point in the future? Uh, well, I get my degree in 1993, so I really get into this career after 1993. So I have to say at that time, I don't really hear that much about earthquake prediction as an important subject to work. Um, still some of them working on earthquake prediction and still government always say, oh, you need to work on earthquake predictions. Um, but I always mention to them saying like, even if we predict the earthquake, the earthquake will still come. It's not like you predict the earthquake and the earthquake will not come. And, and then when I, when I give a public lecture for very wide ideas, it only at the time when you predict the earthquake, you are able to use the energy from the earthquake to minimize the magnitude of the event. The earthquake prediction become important and useful. I mean, what I mean is like, you know, days or week. Uh, so earthquake prediction somehow not really a hot topic in Taiwan. And in the same time, as I mentioned, we have maybe to six, maybe once every month in Hualien area. And once in a while, we'll see someone from outside, like from Russia and from Japan, and say like, oh, we predict earthquake. Uh, you are going to have an earthquake, six, maybe six in Taiwan in next week. We say, well, the chance is pretty high, even with the blind test. So people are pretty calm now, actually, uh, when someone's saying like, People are pretty calm for those that kind of prediction. Kuo Feng, for, for you personally, do you believe that earthquake prediction is something that's feasible in the future, or is it simply impossible because the Earth itself doesn't know when an earthquake will happen? Oh, uh, so far I still feel it's almost impossible. But but I that's also when I study earthquake physics, I think like. If you don't know how the earthquake was nucleated, then you have no way to predict the earthquake, right? And, and so far at this moment, we are still not yet to solve this uh, big question, how the earthquake was nucleated, why the epicenter is at the epicenter, right? And why this earthquake stopped somewhere not going to make you seven, why it stopped and make you five? Uh, so if this kind of topic are not yet well defined, earthquake prediction become just by statistics. It's, it's, it's not, what I'm saying is, well, statistically was not wrong. It somehow still gives some numbers, depends on how you really want to learn from this earthquake prediction um, by statistics or by probability. Uh, so for long-term probability, I think that's important. As I mentioned about earthquake hazard uh, for this issue of our nuclear power plants, or those important infrastructure, uh, we still have to know what's the probability. 
uh, how active was the fault, even though we still have a lot of unknown. But uh, for that part, I think that's important. So, but I don't name this earthquake prediction. I name it like uh, probability, forecasting probability for the ground shaking intensity. Kuofeng, what about earthquake early warning? What is the infrastructure like in Taiwan to give people even a few precious moments before the shaking begins? Yes, that's a very important issue. And then we are working on that. And, and I think it's, so far it's pretty successful. Uh, well, the early warning somehow maybe 10 or 20 years ago began to really uh, important and also Taiwan carry on this. So our government, government Central Weather Bureau they issue this earthquake early warning um, somehow in officially. And then we have some app that people carry on that. Uh, again, as I say, people are usually some are pretty calm, some are pretty nervous. It's hard to judge. Uh, but I, I put those behind is what I'm going to say is earthquake early warning is important. It's also for this uh, infrastructure and also for this, uh, as I mentioned about this industry partner how to stop the instruments before checking. And that's what we can provide. And that's what we are doing actually, right? Uh, if we do a prediction like in Hualien, uh, come to Taipei or to Xinjiang, this important industry park is about 10 seconds. So it's possible to give the warning ahead of time and do the automatic shutdown to the machine. Not a human being reaction, but this somehow uh, automatic uh, process. And I think this is important. And then we are working on that. And also uh, the infrastructure for this elevator, for the hospital. And I think our government put a lot of budget to our national lab to uh, to really implement this to important. Kofeng, what about, what about uh, earthquake engineering in Taiwan? What are some of the architectural and engineering solutions to minimize damage after an earthquake? Yes, uh, I think we also have pretty good team for earthquake engineering. Uh, I think I think for them to do a uh, structure like the bridge and also uh, damp damping structure to to learn how to have a better structure to avoid this long period one motion. So I think it's always a big issue and discussion in our as per engineering partner. Uh, but somehow, I actually, I work with them closely, but in the same time, we have a lot of uh, conversations. Sometimes it's difficult. Is <laughs> of course, they also feel like you scientists always give this crazy number, which we couldn't handle, right? So uh, so earlier, like earthquake hazard, for example, as I mentioned to you, we published, published this earthquake hazard map. But engineer was actually the one not happy with this publication earlier, okay, 10 years ago, but we sit on the, in a meeting, talk about how to make it like the open data. And they feel like the number is crazy. You have this one G700 gal that's too large uh, for us engineering. And I was like, what do you mean by too large? Those are data, <laughs> it's data. It's not like I make up this number, but but why do engineers keep saying like, go from please give the number lower? I just don't understand. But then later, later I realized because from their practice, 500 gal, like 0.5 G is something they couldn't build. It just have to be very expensive building to avoid the impact on 0.5 G. So, so I think something, something is wrong because we observe 0.5 G all the time, not all the time, but large earthquake. Uh, but not all the building collapse. Uh, so, so that's how I, I become to talk to them about this fragility curve, uh, how these scientists go together with engineer and like talk to the central weather bureau, um, the, whether they would like to change the intensity map. Because earlier they only do the intensity for the peak ground acceleration. But damage is not just from peak ground acceleration, it's actually go maybe come from velocity. Uh, so they changed this uh, intensity scale two years ago after our visit. So, so somehow I think, I think the, the, the dialogue was intense, but the solution is good. 
Guofang, I'll ask this question on the basis of you being a scientist generally and a seismologist specifically. Are there opportunities to collaborate with seismologists in mainland China? Given all the geopolitical tensions between mainland China and Taiwan, what are the opportunities, at least for scientists, to work together? Well, I have to say, before this now slightly more difficult time, maybe even from COVID, I don't know, but but before really the tension, we work with the mainland Chinese closely. Uh, for the past 20 years, we have this uh, over Taiwan Strait uh, meeting once every year. And even for our university, we have met, we have our annual meeting with USTC uh, in China. And I, I don't know how many times I visited China. Uh, not to mention all these colleagues I know. Actually, I know them for so long. Some of them are a classmate in US, actually. Um, so science, science part is not a problem at all. It just now the tension becomes so tight and that become tricky. It's actually, there's no rule to say you cannot, but I just don't feel wanted to. <laughs> this is my personal feelings. This is my personal feelings. I just don't feel I wanted to. But before, and, and of course, I, they are still my good friends if we, we meet each other, but I just don't feel like uh, really has to build up this uh, exchange program. But, but it's somehow people can do that. Well, let's now go back and establish some personal history before you got to Caltech. As an undergraduate at National Central University, were you interested in earthquakes and seismology even then? Well, that's very interesting because, you know, in Taiwan, how we get into the university is not like, is not like what you want to be. It's actually we have national entrance exam. And then when I go to the entrance exam, at entrance exam, I don't know what kind of what kind of score I might have. So I just have to put down everything in my wish list. I don't know my score yet. I also don't know how many are better than me, so I might not be able to really get into uh, the the department I want to go to. So at that time, I put on uh, this wish sheet, and I I like physics and mathematics since I was in high school. I don't know why. I just like math and physics. So I put on every math and physics for every national school because in Taiwan, national school is on the top and then private school. So I just put on all the physics. I hate chemistry, so I just don't put any chemistry. And, and I just like engineer. I just like physics and math. So I put on all the physics and math. And then when I put, see this job physics, I remember I asked my older brother, he was physics major. And I asked him, so what is geophysics? I never heard of it. And then my brother said, well, I just want kind of physics anyway. I said, oh, okay. So then I put it down. And I become geophysics in NCU. That's how. And I had no idea what geophysics was doing. And I don't know I want to study elsewhere. I have no idea at all. I just go to that department and I just do it. Yeah. What kind of opportunity did you have for laboratory work during the summers as an undergraduate? Oh, that's actually, uh, for undergraduate, during the intern, the summertime, I actually take an intern in academic sync at the institute I'm in now. And that professor, he was, he is a seismologist. Okay. And, and the reason I go into earthquakes is also to be in geophysics, first year, second year, we study a lot of uh, geology, you know, introduction of geology, mineralogy, pathology, of course, also physics and so on, and math. But I'm not so into those things. Uh, I'm still good in taking the grade, you know, I study hard, so some of my grades look nice, but I just like geology. So I'm like, I don't know what I want to be. I was, I was not so into those. And here I take a course of seismology with all the equations. And then the, the instructor, I mean, the professor said, I feel so sorry to show you all the equations on board. And I was like, why did you want to say sorry? I miss this so much. I like equations. And I began to feel like if I want to stay in this major, I will go for seismology. I will study earthquakes. And then I go to intern in Institute of Earth Sciences for the 
for the earthquake, P word picking for location, locate the earthquake. Yeah, and that's how I began my uh, career in that time. Now tell me student. about tell me about when you transferred to National Taiwan University, being at the Institute of Oceanography. Were you specifically interested in seismology in the oceans? Well, that's also because of Taiwan. Uh, so small. So actually, at that time, the Institute of Earth Sciences is on the campus of NTU. And, and so it's actually, I studied to that institute. It's just, it was closer to my future advisor at that time. So that institution is, I have to say, it's, it's by name, but they still study solid Earth. So I still study uh, earthquakes. Uh, earthquakes even in the Institute of Oceanography. But of course, in the same time, I still study some oceanography uh, as a requirement. Um, the reason for that is for my master degree. I also feel for master, it's good to, uh, to, to have different environment. So I transferred to another university. Not transfer, just go to, you know, go to you know, uh, another university for this degree. Now, by the time you had gotten your master's degree, were you already committed to getting a PhD beyond Taiwan? Were you looking specifically outside of Taiwan for a thesis? Oh, well, because in Taiwan, we have master program, uh, program and then PhD program. So we usually always just go to master and then we think about what's the next. So, uh, or I have to say, I have a lot of influence for my older brother. He, he is physics major and he become engineer. But he taught me, go from if you do science, you have to go for a PhD. Otherwise, you will just follow people's idea, right. not your own idea. Right. So if you want to be a scientist, you have to go for a PhD. But if you want to go to go for a PhD, you have to go to the top school. <laughs> and, and actually, I was 20, 24, 20 something. I have no idea. And then we have to see this English pull for exam. You know, it's not easy just to go abroad for PhD, uh, because also the scholarship, you have to apply for the scholarship, you have to uh, go for the TOEFL exam, you have to go for GRE exam. Uh, that's a lot of preparation. So I was like in between, like, should I go or not to go? Oh, maybe I take some exam and I will see. Uh, and that's how it happened. Yeah. Now, when did you first hear about Caltech and the Seismo Lab? Who told you about it? Oh, that was so funny. I, I have no idea. As you know, in Taiwan, at that time, of course, travel is not really a popular thing, not to mention there's no social media or anything. So it's my professor, as I say, uh, Professor Wang in, NT, and, uh, in Aquino Sinica, in his class, he keep mentioning two names. One is Hiro Kamamori, who is from Caltech. The other one is Keaki from UIC at that time. In the class, he keep mentioning them, they're like, God. And I'm like, why? And, and I just feel that my, my advisor just admired them so much. He keeps saying like, they are the one in our, uh, somehow named this moment magnitude. They're the one keeping the skating law and so on. But Caltech was so far from me. It's just reading in the paper, Caltech. Someone, you know, when we read and say, okay, affiliation Caltech. So I never dream I can be one of them. I actually don't think I can be. It just, when I apply for school, and luckily maybe I was pretty good in my performance. And I apply for school, and usually in Taiwan, uh, at that time, we usually maybe apply 10 school. We have three, you, you know, in the bottom, feel like secure, you might, you, you will go. Maybe the same thing in in US, I think everyone had this kind of policy, right? You have the three secure position and then four somehow in between and three was impossible. But anyway, I tried. So Caltech is one of that impossible, I just tried. So so when I got, the, I still remember when I received the admission from Caltech, I was running to my advisor's office. In the hallway, I just screamed all the way to the office and, Oh my God, I got accepted by Caltech. 
And then it was so easy. I said, you have to go to Caltech for sure. Because at that time, I think you to go to USC in the beginning, because Caltech is the last offer. So, so I still remember where I run in the hallway when I was 24. And I you know, was so active. So I just screaming and yelling in the hall. Yeah. Kuo Feng, had you ever been to the United States before? Of course not. And how was your yes, English I, up to that point? Oh, that was so funny. I, I keep saying to my students, my first year in Caltech, in the very beginning, people considered me as a very quiet person because I couldn't really speak that much English. And the whole way, they say like, oh, where are you going? Nahara, I was like, how is everything going? And I was like, why do you keep asking me where I'm going? You know, I was like, it's, it's all my answer to their question doesn't meet. And then later I was like, oh, it's just hello. You know, before when we learned hello, is how do you do? I'm fine, thank you. That's how we learn the class. So it's a lot of interesting uh, stories behind. It's, I just remember they keep saying terrific. I was like, why do people keep saying this word? What is this word? I have to change the dictionary to understand what do you mean by terrific. Yeah, so a lot of interesting things. Kuo Feng, what what sticks out in your memory when you first arrived at the Caltech campus? Well, I actually uh, was shocked by the history. Uh, I have to say my knowledge was so narrow, so I really don't know how much Caltech had built in before, you know, in the history. So I learned actually by by those statues and, and, and those things one by one. So my, my first impression, not really the campus, is how I meet Professor Hiro Kamamori. Because he was like a god. So when I meet him, I was, I don't know how to speak because like a god in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but actually he is so kind and easy. He explained everything in detail to me. And also at the time, I just feel like I came to Calhoun, I want to work with you. It was so simple. And, and but actually, maybe one or two years later, he told me, yeah, you can work with me, but I don't need, have to, I don't need to say yes, actually. I can, I can decide. <laughs> but at that time, I just feel like I want to work with you. So you have to take me. That kind of feelings. But, uh, but of course, he, he told me as his students. That's such an honor. Kuo Feng, relative to your other fellow graduate students, how well prepared were you coming in, coming right from the master's degree? Well, when I get into Caltech, I have to say everyone is genius uh, in the class. You know, uh, we have to take in some courses in physics and mathematics and so on. And I still remember in the math class, I told you, I, I mentioned that I like math so much. And I am usually... If there's any tough question in class, I am usually the only one solved that question when I was undergraduate students. But when I was in Caltech, in the math class, I was like, I struggled so much to give the answer. And then I realized everyone all hanging in the answers. It seems like I'm the only one struggling, you know, that kind of, that kind of feelings. And then I still remember in that class that a professor uh, even 101, very entry class. And the professor have all these uh, complex equations and so on. And there's one Indian student, I have to say my English was not that good at that time. So I don't understand that student's question at all. But the professor keeps saying like, you will be a superstar. You will be a superstar. And I'm like, oh my God, I don't, I don't understand the professor. I don't understand the student. And the, the professor kept saying he will be the superstar. So what am I going to do? Um, so it's just a lot of impact. But I enjoy so much. It's just to to see how everyone can go with all uh, the problem they solve. And then come to the graduate students to come back to the Sesma lab. We have like five or six. Uh, so uh, in the same time, we work together for all these questions and so on. And, and for research, I have to say, I, I feel fortunate I have my master's degree, so I know how to do research in a way. If I didn't get any master's degree and then come to Caltech directly, I don't think I can finish that smoothly. 
because in Caltech, uh, of course, the supervisor give a good guidance, but they don't teach you from from scratch. You usually have to go on your own way. So I, I was lucky enough. I have my master degree, so I have experience of doing research. So my connection to the PhD diploma or PhD degree slightly smoothly, and I saw my classmate. Some of them are struggling, and uh, and and of course we work together. But then I can see uh, the differences, and I was thinking about myself. If I didn't have my master, I I might struggle like them. Kuofeng, being in the Seismo Lab in the late 1980s and early 1990s, what were some of the big ideas at that time? What were the big research topics that the professors were working on? Yeah, at that time, uh, is the instrument become broad, broadband instruments? Uh, earlier, I think it's only like narrow or analog data, not digital. I was lucky enough, I really get into digital era during my research career. Even the terminal become have windows that we can just operate with windows. I don't need to go to this punch car. You know, sometimes the people told, told me about the program, you have to have a stick of punch car. I was lucky enough I didn't go through that. I was keyboard already. Um, and I remember my first year into Caltech, Hila Palmer showed me the record for 1988 Pasadena earthquake, the waveforms, beautiful waveform. And I have no idea why it is beautiful because I never see anything ugly because I don't see ugly yet. <laughs> so I don't, see, I don't know, broadband is not fancy because in Taiwan at that time, we don't really have the waveform. I think we had only the analog at that time, uh, you know, like a drum and then, and then, and then you have this uh, pen get into these waveforms. So I think for the, for the late nineties that become digital era, so everything become uh, digital and the instrument become broadband. You can really FTP the data from site to your office. And so my advisor showed me that he feels so excited, but I feel nothing at that time. Only like two years later, I become like, no, I understand why he was excited. Because before the record looked so ugly you know, not high resolution and, and oh, it's difficult to analyze the waveform. So for my time, it's the good time for the uh, broadband instruments. So we are able to determine the focal mechanism using waveforms rather than just the uh, arrival time of P wave, the first motion. And also during my PhD program, also the time that we began to work on finite thought. We understand the earthquake was not just a point, by the dimension, and then using using the waveform, we can map how much sleep on the fault, even though we didn't really go into the site, but we are still able to decipher the waveform and then making how much fault was slipped during the earthquake, and that was amazing. Yeah, I didn't know that that's amazing until like five years later. <laughs> Kofang, would Hiro Kanemori, was he set to be your PhD advisor from the beginning, or was that a process for you? Uh, when I came to Caltech, first of all, I have two acad academic advisors. I think that was from the Sesame Lab, directly division, uh, to have uh, uh, Claire Allen and uh, Dan Anderson as my academic advisor. I think at that time, it's somehow what kind of courses I'm going to take and so on. But I just go to Hero at the time. It's because like, I just want to work with you. And, and even for the first year, we are not really doing for the PhD program. I mean, the research topic was not yet defined, but somehow we have so many uh, projects along with the course. So with that class, I go to Hero Conrad to say, oh, I would like to do the project with you. Uh, and then how, that's how we begin. And here the second year, we have to be, as I mentioned, we have to have this official advisors in this, you know, in, in, in the, uh, I don't know, in maybe in the record. And so I go to Hero and I ask him whether he would like to be my advisor. Uh, and then that's how, as I mentioned, he say, yeah, I can be your advisor, but I just want to let, let you know, I, I can also say no. <laughs> because they somehow just feel like, yeah, you will be my advisor automatically. You know, I was so naive. 
Yeah. Kuofeng, I've heard in earlier generations, people who were at the Seismo Lab in the 50s and 60s, before data sharing became really normative in seismology, when the Seismo Lab had data that was almost proprietary, that others needed to come to the lab to access. What was your sense when you were a graduate student? How decentralized was data by the time you were there? Uh, I think I didn't really experience that period because when I was there in 1988, we, we already have this uh, data archive like IRIS. Is that IRIS or WSSN? I, I forgot about this series. Uh, but I remember in, in at that time, I can just go to Kellogg to get the data. But maybe I was not from outside, so I don't know how outside people would get the data. Uh, so I don't know. I just feel like when I want to do the data, data is there. <laughs> so, so, so maybe maybe the experience, the experience will be different if, it's, if I'm not in Caltech. I don't know whether people get the data has to go through all this process. I don't know. Tell me about developing your thesis topic. Okay, oh, that's also another interesting topic. Is I work on tsunami in the beginning. The reason for that is I do the final difference for my master's degree. And then here I come, come to me and say, oh, go for you do the final difference calculation. Uh, do you want to work on tsunami? And I was like, what? I even don't know the word tsunami actually. I, I couldn't recognize this vocabulary. I was like, what is this? Oh, tsunami. And then I, and then I like, fine, yeah, uh, it's fine. Difference. I can do the calculation. At that time, there's another professor, Kenji Satake. He's now a director of uh, EI. Uh, he was a postdoc, and then he, of course, Japan worked on a lot of tsunami. So, so for me, I, I'm so easy for all the topics. So whatever they feel like, oh, what do you want to work on that? I say, oh, sure. Then I. I, I do that. So I do that. Then at that time, 1989, I'm a Plato earthquake that generates small tsunami. So I use that tsunami record uh, to study the fault. And then uh, the Kalapana earthquake in Hawaii. And I often say, whether I feel lucky or in other way, my thesis is a sequence of California earthquake. I was there in 1988, and there's a 1988 Pasadena earthquake. Then when I finished the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake, and I, when I finished 1989 Loma Prieta in 1992 latest earthquake, but 1989 and 1992, there's a couple, uh, there's 1991 Sierra Madre earthquake. So when I finished Sierra Madre earthquake, I was like, hmm, maybe I should study something else. And then, and then, and then here I say, oh, you can work on the 1975 Kalapana earthquake in Hawaii. Uh, for tsunami. I say, okay, I do that. So when I finished that in 1992, the like, Landers earthquake. But when Landers earthquake come, I talked to, and I was talking, I said, don't come again. I want to finish. <laughs> I want to finish my degree. No more big bear, other things. Just, just finish. I want to finish and to get my degree. So I talked to him and say, do you think it's about time for me to get my degree? And I say, yeah, so later this earthquake, I did not finish all, okay? And, and in 1995, in Northridge, I become feel like, somehow I feel like, oh, I miss this earthquake. I should study that one. And then after 1995, it becomes silent for so long. So, so my time there, my every chapter is one earthquake in Southern California in sequence. Kofang, I'm curious, with all of your focus on Southern California, did you see opportunity to extrapolate what you were learning in that region to what was happening in Taiwan? In other words, when is the research approach really locally focused, and when can you make those broader determinations about earthquakes on a worldwide scale? Yeah, actually, that's very important. Uh, my experience in California, in, in Caltech, is how I can explain myself in Taiwan. And I have to go back to very beginning is when I get my degree, I talk to Hiro saying like, I only want to go to Taiwan or stay in California because I have to fly to Taiwan once every year. I couldn't go to East. I know you are not in New York. I couldn't go to East coast, that's too far. Right. So either in, in, in the West coast or go back to Taiwan. And then you say, you know, Taiwan has such important network, as I mentioned, 
that why senior he convinced our government to have the strong motion network in Taiwan since 1992. And then here, Kalamari told me, you know what, Taiwan is the only place have the network before the large earthquake. Every country always has a network after the earthquake because the budget always come after the earthquake. And then Taiwan is so wise to have this important network. It's good time to go back. And and that's and of course NCU is also very keen for me to go to come back. So they give me the title to real position immediately. So I come to Taiwan, as you mentioned about the data, I actually feel like it's important to share the data. So and then our government also learned like the data sharing is important. So for my for my time, for my generation, I was also lucky enough that when I access data from the Central Weather Bureau, I don't need to wait. I can just access the data directly. I think before, you know, some people just like five or six years older than me, they experienced all the hard times like I started the earthquake, I couldn't get the data, how can I do? So I, I made my own data, so I transferred to exploration. That's how my colleagues say. Yeah, well, so, and then also at that time when I come back to Taiwan, I was like, I don't know anything about Taiwan tectonics. Even though I, under, I study undergraduate in Taiwan, but I was not so into that. So I didn't really, really put that into my brain. I just do that as the exam rather than really into my brain. So, so, so when I come back to Taiwan, all my thing is California, the, the active falls, not about Taiwan. So, so I learned gradually, but in the same time, those knowledge I learned from Caltech, like waveform analysis, how important to share the data, how can we learn earthquake more from the waveform, I implement all that into Taiwan. So that's very important. Kofang, who besides Hiro Kanemori was on your thesis committee at Caltech? Is it who? Yeah. Say that again? Who else was on your committee besides Hiro? Yeah, uh, I have to say some people I forgot, but Claes Allen and uh, Dan Hamburger, um, and I think it's uh, one from Clinton Sciences. I forgot his name, Murphy, maybe. Yeah, and also Dan Anderson. I think that's in my in my committee. And I, I but I remember more is for my qualify exam. Uh, at that time my English was not so good yet, and we had to have this qualify exam as a PhD candidate uh, one year after enter Caltech. So that was in October. You know, I was in Caltech. I think eighty nine. So I have the defense on 90s October, just one one year. Uh, then the question was so tough. What I mean by tough is, it's not something I present in the class. They give me the question like, who from you study Q, you study attenuation. Okay, so I'm gonna have the rock. Tell me, how can you determine the Q? I was like, what? <laughs> you know, like, that kind of question. And also they said, Okay, good fun. So if I have the this is a fault and I give you the funding, what are you going to do? Or like that kind of all these kind of questions, but well I think I, my answer may be all right, so I passed, but somehow I was so nervous and intense at that time. And that's actually more intense than my PhD defense. What would you say some of your key arguments or contributions were with your thesis? Yes, for, for my thesis, I think I uh, important thing is, as I mentioned, for the tsunami and the problem, I actually have two parts. One is tsunami, one is the broadband problem waveform inversion. So so one thing is for the broadband waveform inversion, inversion at that time to provide a waveform to determine the focal mechanisms and to understand how the relationship with the active force. So that's somehow the important topic using one station to determine all these mechanisms. And for the tsunamis, uh, we are able to pin down the tsunami waveform to the source, like Kalapana earthquake, to understand that tsunami generation is due to a uh, volcano eruption or the earthquake in 1976. And for the Loma Prieta earthquake, we try to understand the tsunami in a Monterey Bay is due to the change of the fault 
or the sediments in the uh, Monterey Bay. So certainly not really a big impact, but somehow gave some answers to the understanding of some phenomena. Guo Feng, did you ever give thought to remaining in the United States, pursuing a career here? Uh, well, at that time, as I mentioned, I want to stay either in California only, the West Coast or Taiwan. But in the same time, uh, I have to say at that time, I have baby already, I have family. So I, it's difficult to move, move around. So I see people doing the post here and there. I feel it's difficult for me. I, I need to have more uh, permanent location. Uh, and also only, as I mentioned, to Taiwan or in Western coast. And here I say Taiwan is a great opportunity for me in a university, so I decided to come back. So I still feel I made the right choice to come back. Guo Feng, as a woman, as a foreign born woman at, in the Seismo Lab, did you ever feel not part of the club, if you know what I mean? Yeah, I know, but, but I don't know. I feel I was quite happy there. I don't really feel any discrimination or somehow uh, unfriendly treatment. Uh, I have to say all the Sesma Lab staff was so kind to me. Even Hirokamori's secretary, and Freeman, we still have a connection. Oh. And he, she still gave me the birthday wish every time, and I still see her all the time. And my daughter was born when I was in Sesma Lab. My daughter even go to see her frequently call her American grandma. It's so it's just this close. So so all the secretary, they are so nice to me and and it just like a friends. Yeah. Tell me about your first faculty appointment back in Taiwan. Well my faculty position as I mentioned is in NCU and I become associate professor right away. So I never really go through postdoc. I didn't go through assistant professor. And now, actually, it's also at that time that, that they told me that I was the last generation of associate professor immediately, because at that time we are, we don't we didn't have the assistant professor check our uh, track yet. It start with associate professor, and also people don't feel it's necessary to go through the postdoc. So I become associate professor right away. And I was only 29 at that time. So when I was in class, I actually forget I'm a professor because I was 29. And I still give this joke to my, to my um, colleague or to younger students or female scientists. I remember I, I went to a meeting and then uh, the dean didn't know me yet, but I'm a female sitting in the front. And then he just gave me a stack of paper, say, just read all the paper out. So they considered me as a secretary. And I was sitting there, we're like, oh, do I have to do that? And they said, do that. I said, okay. And then later on, we actually realized I'm, I'm a faculty. It's just this kind of story because the female is so easy to put into that category. And not to mention when I was a department chair, they were coming, people would come in and they consider me as a secretary and then discuss things. And then I said, oh, I need to see your chairman. I say, I am the chairman. And they're like, what? Because at that time I was 35. So, so I, I actually enjoyed this in reaction. <laughs> and here the people don't have that reaction. They can be like, oh yeah, that shows my seniority. But, but at that time, if I go to some school, it's like, oh, I want to have the, I'm coming for the exam. They'll say, oh, are you a student? I say, no, I'm the professor. <laughs> no more. People don't ask that at all. Not anymore. Kofang, as you yeah. mentioned, all of your research focus at Caltech on Southern California, coming back to Taiwan, what did you need to do to get up to speed about seismicity and tectonic shifts in Taiwan? Um, actually, there's some struggle in the beginning. It's because when I was in Caltech, I feel size is something you don't need to, there's no territory. You, you, you know, maybe there's some territory, but somehow people were bringing their knowledge freely. But when I come back to Taiwan, I find that I have no position. What I mean by position is I don't know what I can focus on because somehow they have some territory uh, not clearly defined. It was say, oh, people are working on tectonics. Some people are working on earthquake 
uh, focal mechanism. Some people working on earthquake location. So, so if I do something, somehow it seems like I'm stepping on some, someone's feet. Uh, so in the beginning, I actually feel a little bit struggle as I don't know where I can really bring in all my knowledge or what I want to study. Uh, but gradually I realized, well, in the beginning, somehow people will say no to me. So like, Guo Feng, we've been working on this. So uh, we, we don't need to share more with you, you know, something like that. Uh, well, I don't know how far it happens, but somehow I just gradually do one thing after another, and I think people just get used to it. I, I don't know exactly how it, it changed. I just remember I do the tomography, and people say, Wu Feng, your answer is wrong. And I was like, what do you mean by wrong? And then people will come you know, outside and say, oh, Wu Feng, I, I heard someone say your, your result was, was incorrect. I'm like, what do you mean by incorrect? Show me what part is incorrect. And then gradually bring in this conversation uh, and then to break through these kind of questions or, or doubt about what I've been doing. And then it becomes go smoothly as it goes. I think just in the beginning, people are cautious, maybe. Kofang, tell me about how you got involved in learning more about earthquake physics through deep scientific drilling. Yeah. Um, well, actually, I, I, my, my PhD thesis is, is, as I mentioned, tsunami and broken waveform. It's nothing to do with drilling and so on. But it's 1999, this earthquake was a very big impact to me. Um, I was out in the field, and I have to say my, my, my kids are so little at that time. So when the big earthquake strike, I was at home. I was at the sixth floor. In the beginning, as I mentioned, we got an earthquake all the time, so I just shake and then finish. But that one is not. That one is very, very long time. And then, and then of course, uh, the kids are terrified. And I, I was also don't know what to do. And the second day, I, at, at that time, I was like, I'm a seismologist, and this big earthquake come, and I don't know what to do. What am I doing? You know, and. So the second day we went to the school, we, we went to school and of course a lot of professors are all out in the field and we learn more and more. And we and I was so sad to to learn them how many life lost during this earthquake. And then uh, I was but I'm a seismologist, so what am I doing? I, what can I do better? Uh, to skip all this emotional part, uh, is when we go to this go to the field, this large sleep. And then I, I still remember I was in the front of very large, like 10 meters um, uplifting. I was standing there, I was like, now I know what is earthquake plate tectonics. So plate tectonics is not just a question in the book. It's not just the exam I took in the, in the class because that's always the exam question, what is plate tectonics? It's real. The earth is moving. It's moving this much in few seconds. So I was so shocked. It's like what I learned in the book is real. It's not just in the book. The second thing is why? What kind of mechanism can move this much? What's the reason? So I became to go to Oscar physics is to understand what's the reason to have this big movement and also why this building damage. And, and that's how I move myself from from earthquake physics also to earthquake engineering because I want to be also more practical to really bring in our knowledge to people. Kuofeng, tell me about developing a seismic network in Taiwan and your role in that. Uh, I didn't really have a role in that actually. I'm just a user. Uh, the network basically operated by strong uh, by Central Weather Bureau. So we have a very um, good colleague in, in government agents, they operate this network. I I don't need to do anything on that. I just FTP the data back. Uh, they do a good job for the quality control and so on. And the other network is by uh, IES, the institute I'm in, Academia Sinica, for the broadband waveform, our broadband instruments in Taiwan. Uh, we call it BATS, B-A-T-S, Broadband Array in Taiwan for Seismology. And that was also operated by another colleague in IES. 
So I am very luckily is like FTP the data and analyze the data. I, I don't really uh, maintain the network. But for the drilling, I put a bore seismometer in. That's how I, I do that. It's uh, for a certain topic, I put a bore seismometer crossing the fault, like after the drilling. And the drilling is also interesting as, I, of course the dream actually is how I can have a good international collaboration and also how I work with Emily Brasky closely. Um, and that's that's uh, how all this together, like Europe, Japan, um, US for the drilling is because we never drill and I'm not a geologist. I never see the rock before. So when earlier they say, oh, both of you are the PI for TCDP, they say, I, I always say, yeah, that was a joke. I never really go to the field, but somehow I just feel that's a very important topic we have to work on. And I think that's also important for international. It's just not for Taiwan. It's also for international how to learn how a large slip was produced during the earthquake. So we have to do it. But I never drew up before. I never see the coin before. <laughs> so, so I think I'm just lucky to be supported by by all the people, they, they agree with me, this is an important topic, let's work on that. Yeah. Tell me why the, 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 the drilling project in 1999 for TCDP, why was it so successful? And why then did it attract such international attention? Yes, uh, I think pretty at that time, Japan was doing pretty much, that's for 1995, Kobe earthquake. But Kobe Espe was a stressful fault. That means you have to drill a hole to, you know, never, and then have the sidetrack to hit the fault. Uh, but for GG Espe, it's a shallow dipping, 30 degree. And also we have very large slip at the surface. So we are able to really access the fault zone to somehow manageable budget. So that's how the GG Espe, that we can, we can just have the vertical hole and then hit the fault, which has a very large slip, as I mentioned about this, 10 meters. Uh, so that become the only one in the world, still actually so far, the, the clear evidence to show this is a fresh slip zone right after the earthquake. So from that, from that fault gouge, we are able to uh, measure you know, the grain size, the chemical and physical process and also to understand the friction coefficient is so low, is much lower than the number we had before, like 0.6 for the barley law. But in the friction, in the uh, in the large slip, it can be less than 0.1. So that's why it's important, and and because that's a direct evidence to uh, to bring some hypothesis. Guofang, tell me about the role of this research and what it taught us about fault zone dynamics. Yes, uh, the reason, as I mentioned, we talk about this 10 meter slip, um, the large slip. So the reason is for the core, we see this some fluid uh, involved during the slipping. So, so once the fault really ruptured very fast, the fault might be widened and the fluid coming in to lubricate the fault. So we, when we retrieve the, the core, we can show that as evidence to see that's the process for the thermodynamics. And, and also from the, from the chemical, even though I, I told you I don't like chemistry, I, 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 I dislike geochemistry, but at that time I decided, I become to learn geochemistry about this elite, this clay, the, the, the change of position of clay, composition of clay, to give the indicator about how much heat was generated during faulting. And, and then I was like, oh, that's how geochemistry was doing. And then I become all this mineralogy, pathology I learned in undergraduate, bring in to this small core and to my waveform simulation. As I mentioned to you, I also only look at the seismic waveform. And the seismic waveform near the drill site show very long period motion. And we don't know what's the reason to give this long period. And here we get a core because this thermodynamics procedure lubricate the fault to give this long period motion. And now engineer become to be aware how this long period, long period motion impact the buildings in the neighborhood. 
Quilfon, yeah. tell me about your research on the connections between fault zones and natural hydraulic fracturing. Yes. Uh, well, so as I mentioned, after drilling, uh, we put the ball seismometer in. Uh, at that time, again, I talked to my student. I say, well, Southern Cof uh, I think it's South Africa. South Africa has this minimum minimum magnitude, what's the minimum magnitude we can detect? How small is small? So I talk to my students, let's beat how small is small. Let's see how much we can do from the ball seismometer. Okay, but in the same time, I also say, well, and then I think observation for one year, we don't really see the earthquake nearby. We find out this complete stretch of we don't have any earthquake on the fall actually. So I talked to my students, uh, SAFO actually doing a lot, uh, well, SAFO was not yet began, but somehow somehow there's a lot of borehole seismometer study in Southern California and South Africa also have a lot of beat the minimum magnitude. And I told my students, we couldn't beat the minimum magnitude because we don't have earthquake nearby, but we still have to do something unique. Oh, I say, I don't want to repeat anyone they have been observing. I want to see something they don't see because we are in the in the fall zone which just live for 10 meters and we put a ball seismometer in we're supposed to see something people don't see it right so if there's anything people have seen it let's drop it i want to focus to something people don't see so my poor students a <laughs> peer distance we look at from i one by one to say we just focus on the event nearby, but small enough, but unique. So we category, category different group. And I saw this uh, important observation only with P wave without S wave. And we're like, is that real? Or is that instrumentation problem? So if that's an instrumentation problem, then of course that's artificial. So I have to prove that's real. So all this process, and then uh, going to AGU, of course, a lot of colleagues were criticized, say, oh, no, 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 this is X-wave there. I think, I think this, this is something you missed. Maybe what you are seeing is X-wave, P-wave, somewhere you disappear. So, so through AGU, I'm able to somehow justify my observation. Whatever they give the question, I would say, no, 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 I already checked. This is the answer. But if the same question is something I did not think about, I say, okay, let's very good, let me, let me do that. So, uh, well, in the end, uh, we proved this isotropic event might be due to this natural hydraulic because the fluid migration, because the fall zone is so impermeable, the fluid might be, might be trapped beneath the fall zone and then give this natural phenomena. And, and actually later on for this hydrofract, you know, for this uh, shell, gas shell, they see a lot of relating features, but what we observe is the nature events. And that's how, how, how it happened. And I'm glad that we are able to do something unique. <laughs> Kuofeng, what were the implications of this research on our understanding of some of the seismological uh, concerns relating to fracking for energy reserves? Yeah, uh, at that time I was, uh, it, it's also to, for the energy issue, I keep saying is it shows actually for the bubble seismometer, you are able to detect the very small events. And, and that's important for also now the news is, well, that's the news maybe five or six years ago is because of this fracking issue. So people are terrified and then all oh, this just some has to shut down. Right. And so, so somehow I feel like if you have a ball seismometer, you are able to really have a good detection. You can give this green light or, or red light about maybe the induced seismicity might give some impact or it's not, it's not something you have to worry. That's one thing. But come back to, come back to, uh, uh observation itself. I think that somehow can give to understand the healing process of the fault. So my hypothesis for the isotropic event was the reason for that is the fluid was capped, but in the same time, because we had this complete stress, near complete stress drop, the stress is somehow equivalent. But 
but the play motion might might still bring in the stress on the fault. So eventually, this isotropic, isotropic event might disappear. Actually, this is something I have to, I, I need to catch up now for the study to see whether this isotropic event decay with time. But in the same time, we also don't know how long the fault will heal, right? The earthquake of this type happened for some before maybe every 300 years by, by the trenching later. Uh, 10 years or 20 years are not long enough, but still, whether we are able to see the recovering of the stress from this kind of observation. And that's something I feel is important to do. Guofeng, the somewhat technical question relating to more recent work. First, what is the threshold of a micro earthquake? How small does it have to be to be a micro earthquake? And then what is the value of studying micro earthquakes in order to understand earthquake nucleation? Uh, well, I think we don't have a clear definition for micro earthquake, but I think maybe in general, less than magnitude two, because that's somehow the network is almost the threshold for the network to, to detect. Uh, for example, as I mentioned, Central Weather Bureau, we have M sub C, which is complete magnitude, uh, which is two or 1.5. So my first claim might define as this value, you know, less than 1.5 or two. But if you go to even smaller, we actually go to minus one or minus two. I think minus one, I think minus 1.5 is somehow the extreme we can we can get now. As I mentioned, uh, South Africa mining, that's from mining, uh, I think there are minus four, uh, but we still don't know how small can be small. Yeah. I and then for the- for, No, please, yeah, please. Uh, yeah, I just forget, you have one more question I would like to answer now, is about- Earthquake why nucleation, want, yes. Why do you want to understand the micro earthquake? Because, because it, as the nucleation mode, uh, but that's why we want to have a borehole or or this uh, Midas project. I was saying is uh, the nucleation actually in the beginning of my, I mean maybe microseconds, right? But microseconds is very easy to attenuate it if you have station at the surface. So if you have observation at the surface. Those, those waveforms already are uh, contaminated due to the uh, heat or due to the medium attenuation. So if you can be as close as possible to the micro events, then you are able to capture this microseconds nucleation phase. And then we can see how large the energy was released and how much stress was needed maybe we can resolve this uh, mystery about earthquake nucleation. And also, how is that related to fluid maybe? Uh, some fluid migration might also generate those micro earthquakes. Guofeng, what were some of the key discoveries in your research relating to dynamic stress propagating from remote earthquakes? That part didn't really uh, involve that much. I think Emily did a lot for the for the dy dynamic triggering from the remote earthquake. I think I think in Taiwan, for example, Wen Chuan earthquake, uh, two thousand six, Wen Chuan earthquake in Sichuan, uh, we do see some groundwater level changes. Those things was uh, detected, but still not really well explained. I think it, it's more like phenomena. And that's actually for the MIDAS project, as I mentioned, I have this exciting project is I have this four hole with optical fiber, but in the center, I have another hole to measure the fluid and also temperature change and the pressure change. And I, I want to see whether I can actually cap, capture this phenomena at one site, and then maybe possible to, to give some physical uh, insight of this behavior. But dynamic triggering things, yeah, of, I think groundwater was clear, but I didn't really go to that field that much. Tell me about the origins of the Taiwan earthquake model and how you envisioned it becoming part of the global earthquake model. Right. Uh, the, the beginning of Taiwan's earthquake model uh, is actually invited by Ross Stan. Uh, he was at USGS at that time. I don't know whether you know Ross Stan. Uh, 
yeah, uh, he he actually was the foundation for global astronomy model. And he came to Taiwan. Uh, at that time, he was at USGS, so I know him when I visited USGS. Uh, and then he mentioned about this idea of a global astronomy model. And also, that's about also the time um, when I started the PCPP that was, actually was in 1999, but the drilling started in 2006, 2005. <laughs> So I finished the drilling about 2015, and I thought to myself, what am I going to do for the next 10 years? What's my target for the next 10 years? For the TCDP, I do the 10 years for the science topic, but what am I going to do? What, what, what is the next for myself? And also at that time, Hiro Kamamori, again, my supervisor, he comes to Taiwan very often. I actually uh, invite him over several times, and he told me, Guofeng, if you want to study earthquake, you have to talk to engineer. Because engineer is the, the one can provide solution. Scientists just find the problem. So you have to talk to engineer. Before 2000, 2015, I don't talk to engineer that much because I was working on drilling and so on. And so then I was like, yes, I, I maybe I should put myself, not just for the science, but in the same time to the engineer. And then Rastan's invitation just come back, come about the right time. He said like, Go for global square model, we want to bring the geology engineer and government agency to have the solution. We have the science, we have the engineer, and then the policy. So, and, and that's how we can bring things together. And also at that time, I was also matured enough. I, I'm able to talk to our, our minister directly. You know, if I was still junior, I think I don't have position to really talk to the minister. But but at that time, I think I was also mature enough. I was I was director, so I I make appointment to our Ministry of uh, Science and Technology, and I and I talk to him. I saying like. Uh, I think the earthquake is, as I mentioned, is something we cannot avoid in Taiwan. But but also for our science study in Taiwan, it's about enough, not to say enough, it's about time to put the things together and then deliver to engineer. And also engineer also at that time, they often come to me saying like, well, from, I don't know how can I do with any result from scientists because everyone give me different answer. So if I ask you, you give me the answer uh, as about as what I say, this this four maybe make you six. But if I go to the other one, maybe the Dr. Lee was that this four actually only general, generate make me five. I don't know, how can I follow? So, uh, and then for engineer in practice, they couldn't have something, they, they couldn't you know have a specific, specific answer. So, Come to that, and then Taiwan's model. I think it's about time that we have this important platform to put the science together, and then to have one window to engineer. If they request for some question, we can have some answer to them. The answer is optimum. I keep saying it's not. We don't have a perfect answer, but somehow that's the the best answer we can give at this moment. Uh, so that's how we build this Taiwan earthquake model is to uh, somehow provide this platform to put this earthquake related knowledge in one table. And then we update this knowledge once every five years. What I mean by update this knowledge is by publication, by, um, yeah, basically have to be in publication and then put it together. Kuo Feng, what have been some of the primary values of the Taiwan earthquake model to Taiwanese industry? Planning where industrial parks are going to be located and mitigating damage from earthquakes. Oh, I realize we have no power of doing that. Usually they already decide where they want to be. I often feel like, why do you have this print right next to the fault? <laughs> so we don't know the fault, okay? Uh, but there's a lot of factors, right? They, they, it's, it's a lot of factors, and four maybe just one of them. So usually is they already have the location, and so so what our screen model do is you already have your location, and let me calculate how much risk you might face, 
uh, they're actually fine. They're actually saying like, let me get prepared uh, uh, to update this facility or through the earthquake insurance. Actually, insurance, after earthquake, after I have this tunnel earthquake model, I realized how much value through this earthquake insurance uh, for the industry partner as well. But they usually have this confidential thing. So, so it's so different. You know, in science, everything's open to them. Everything is confidential stuff. So I said, oh, good one. Can you calculate the risk for me? I said, yeah, okay. So I need to have some site response data. I said, no, that's confidential. So can I go to your site to deploy the station? No, that's confidential. I'm like, how can I do it? But everything's confidential. So, so we just using the public data, but, but uh, the knowledge is still very good to communicate. Um, so still very valuable. Beyond the global earthquake model, does the Taiwan earthquake model fit into a more regional conglomeration in Eastern Asia and the Pacific Rim? Yes, uh, yeah, thank you to bring those up. So we work closely with Japan, of course, and actually now we just, again, to have this project to work on the Ryukyu subduction zones from Japan all the way to Taiwan. Uh, so we have Taiwan, Japan annual mailing um, for 10 years, but then New Zealand joined in 2016. So now we have trilateral Taiwan, Japan, New Zealand once every year. So uh, this year will be in Taiwan, next year will be in New Zealand. Uh, and it's also the earthquake comes with also once every year. It's like we have the earthquake in 2016, and then there's a uh, Kumamoto earthquake in Japan, and then Kakora earthquake in, in New Zealand. I said, oh, it's a circle, so Taiwan may be the next, so we have to get prepared. Uh, but anyhow, so so that's that's a beyond global earthquake model. We also have this regional collaboration, and Korea actually also wants to join, but Korea doesn't really have that high seismic hazard. It's just one earthquake, maybe 10 years ago, bring them a big impact. At that time, people also argue those may be the trigger events, but somehow Koreans sometimes join as a, as a guest, rather than for us, it's for sure that we are trilateral. Because the COVID, so it's been in Taiwan for a couple of times, and, and my colleagues say, we have to have this meeting this year because I don't want to be in Taiwan. And, we have to go to New Zealand, so, so so we are going to have this meeting in Taiwan in October, and then hopefully next year in New Zealand. Uh, Come back to global earthquake model is Taiwan to join the global earthquake model is also very challenging. Is because of China, right? And and we are able to join using Taiwan earthquake model. I have to thanks to Rastan. In the beginning, everyone is using national flag by their country. But Taiwan is not allowed to use in our national flag as a member. And that's why we name ourselves Taiwan as mother to make Taiwan visible because we cannot use our national flag. And then mainland China was not happy with our membership, but we are able to join is because China was not a member. And China doesn't want to expose their data to public because for global earthquake model is you have to make yourself visible, transparency. And China doesn't want to be that transparency. So they never join. And that's how we can join as well. And in the same time, it's also we can make our, our results or our study more international. And that's also important for our government to by us, you know, it's because we are international member and we can talk to the government, what we have done here as this national hazard map is up to date, is state of the art study because that's international recognized and it's, it's somehow comparable to international level. And that's also how we are able to convince our government and even the policy making so that's very helpful to have this international um, membership. Kuofeng, as we move our conversation closer to the present, I wonder if you can talk about some of the value you have derived from very old seismograms, things that are almost artifacts at this point. Right. Uh, as I mentioned, I was so lucky that in 19, late 90s become digital. 
So I was like, it's only four will work on analog data. You know, because I was working on 1989, Pasadena earthquake, 1992 lenders, it's all digital. And I saw some people was digitizing this old analog data. I was like, what a fool, why do you want to waste the time doing that? But until I become more mature in seismology, I realize how important those analog data is because earthquake comes once every hundred years. All those big earthquake, the record was very precious. So I began to study 1906 uh, Mason earthquake. And that earthquake was very important is because 1906 <clears throat> is a magnitude seven event, but the surface rupture is so short, only like 15 kilometers. And people don't understand why. So when we look at the waveform, we actually I went to Tokyo, I went to Tokyo University to get the data because Taiwan at that time was a colony by Japan. And 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 the important data is always missing because everyone is taking the data away and never return. Then the data has been, so we couldn't identify those records in Taiwan. And here I go to Tokyo University. And then as I mentioned, Kenji Satake was in ERI in charge of this archive. And then he said, go for this is the whole section for Taiwan. You go for it. And then I dig out this main house record and analyze the record. And I realized the driving force is underneath. It's not the surface one. Surface one is the one, you know, light your eyes, but real, real driving force is underground. And the surface one is just a sidetrack. Uh, and then that's important for our Taiwan square model, right? It's, it's, it's the full system. It's not just the one you saw at the surface. It's, it's the whole four system. And then I began to study in 1916, uh, another earthquake in Central Weather Bureau, uh, in, in central, under the Central Range. And 1920, um, eight earthquake. So uh, because of the Taiwan earthquake model, I have to understand what's the earthquake hazard. And then I understand how precious those historical records are. And I, I, I uh, put myself into that. Uh, in the same time, I also feel if you are a junior scientist, it's difficult to put your career into those topics because you don't know whether you can get any answer out or, or whether you can have any publication if you want to get promoted or get a tenure position uh, because the risk, you might put a lot of effort but nothing come out because a lot of uncertainties. I also studied the 1604 Quanzhou earthquake in, in China. Uh, that's a magnitude eight earthquake but it's not a flashing zone. Uh, from the literature to understand how this shaking, it's so much fun actually, it's like a historian and I enjoy doing it. But uh, yeah, it's something uh, you put in, you don't know whether you, you can have answer. Guofeng, at the beginning of our talk, we, we, we discussed some of your current activities. So now that we've worked right up to the present, for the last part of our discussion, a few retrospective questions about your career and then we'll end looking to the future. So first, if you can think back to your time at the Seismo Lab, what did you learn there about collaboration, about how to do the science that stayed with you, that's informed your research ever since? Well, I have to say all my nutrition in my career come from Caltech, especially my classmates. They are all non profit They are all these nice professor scientists. I learned from them I, and I still have all this uh, dialogue with them. So if I have key questions, I can always go to them. And then we always have this good discussion and I send my students to them. Uh, so somehow it becomes like a more and more involvement just after me. We have so many, my students or, or some other colleague, they went to Caltech also, either just for visiting program or for postdoc and for PhD and so on. And also as Emily Brodsky, actually she is much younger than me. Uh, she actually entered Caltech, I already get my degree, but because I visit Caltech almost once every year at that time. Uh, so I saw Emily in, in class, uh, in the system like coffee hour. Uh, so I still see all these uh, Caltech students and we keep having this conversation. 
So uh, I feel all my career is come from what I have learned from since my life and also the later on for any connection because of because of Caltech. Yeah. And uh, in the beginning of my career, I also feel like if I go to a GU meeting, they say, oh, this is both from, from Taiwan. Well, people don't care, you know, what the Taiwan is for, right? But they say, oh, she was from Caltech. And then people were like, you, know, you, you see the change in the eyes. And they would say, oh, she was a student of Kawamori. And I, oh, and then they begin a conversation, <laughs> right? And, and, then, and then maybe like 10 years were like that. I was like, yeah, people talk to me only because I was from Caltech. Uh, but then later, I'm glad people not talk to me. Maybe uh, still I was from Caltech, but they also recognized me as my work in Taiwan. And I think that's something I think, I think that's fortunate to know. To realize that. Kuofeng, if you could look back to your your time as a graduate student to now, what were some of the big mysteries in the field that have been resolved and what remains an open question? Uh, I think the important resolve problem is the, uh, how do you call it, how am I going to say, maybe the slip distribution of the fault, how much fault was slipped. Uh, during the earthquake by seismogram. I feel that's a genius way. Uh, so so whenever earthquake comes, now it's almost routine. Like we know how how big this earthquake and how much energy was released and how much fall was slipped. Uh, but something we still not yet to resolve as we discuss is how the fall was nucleated, how the earthquake was nucleated, how the fall was ended, and how long does it take to hear the fault? How much the stress can recover from this one to the next one? Even though now we have the red and state <clears throat> simulation to generate the synthetic earthquakes, but I still I still feel this architecture, the fault architecture, was not yet to be implemented well to really have a better number to predict the behavior of the fault. That's something we might have to work on more. Kuofeng, for all of the research and all of the collaborations that you've been involved in, what are you most proud of and where do you see you've made the greatest impact? Well, again, I always recall the time when I get my PhD degree, I have that outside and I talk to myself. I was like, there's so many genius in the world, not to mention what I already see in Caltech. So nothing will change without me as a seismologist. I mean, as a seismologist, mean nothing to the world as a Gofon because so many genius, I couldn't contribute more. But then now after all these years, I feel like I'm glad I might contribute something to Taiwan to have this uh, impact to change the policy, to bring in the science to, as I mentioned, this uh, borehole seismometer, the drilling, and then also have the special attention from international community to see what Taiwan has been doing. So when the Tishis earthquake occurred, uh, I was thinking as I want to have an important publication because I don't want to feel Taiwan is just the one suffered the large earthquake. I want to show Taiwan has seismologists which can contribute something to the world. And that's actually something come out in my mind when I was, as I mentioned, I was like shocked by that. And also all these uh, casualties. And I feel that's something we have to do something also, you know, for the city, for, for all this life. And I'm glad I might come to something like that in certain way. And that's something I feel grateful. Finally, Kuo Fang, looking to the future, for all that you've accomplished, what remains to be done? What's most important and interesting to you for as long as you want to be active in the field? Uh, I think something I want to be to carry on is again the ground motion to the buildings. Is uh, how can we contribute to the knowledge to reduce the impact from the large earthquake? In reality, of course, engineers, they, 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 they always say, I can just build the better buildings, but what do you mean by better? 
Uh, so I I want to I want to make this become a number. You know, it's to just to give the index. And then for Taiwan is also uh, well, actually, for my age now, I try not to do too much <laughs> ideas that I like, should do this, we should do that. Uh, and in the same time, I also feel like there's a new generation, they might be able to contribute more. So my role now becomes just to uh, have a good transition. In the same time, I, I also would like to bring somehow, what can I say, maybe, maybe to lead uh, breaking some direction that people can bring in, but also to be recognized. Maybe simple way to say so, but I don't know. I didn't answer this question well. <laughs> You'll always be open to interesting research, though. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah. I could have stopped myself. So when I ever, I say, oh no, I don't think I should do that. I say, well, I don't believe you, and I couldn't stop myself either. So, so in the same time, I like, yeah. Uh, actually, um, not doing science is so so important and so fun. Is I was busy, but but I'm I enjoy to be busy. But of course, I can also decide what to do, what to be busy, what not to be busy. But somehow, I think it's still interesting to carry on this study. Well, Fang, on that note, it's been a great pleasure spending this time with you. I'm so glad we were able to capture your perspective. Thank you so much. Thank you so much and thank you for all these key questions.